John 18, verse 38. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. Now turn over to Luke's gospel, chapter 23, and let's begin reading in verse 1. Then the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Then Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him and said, It is as you say. So Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no fault in this man. But they were the more fierce, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked if the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at the time. Now when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he had desired for a long time to see him, because he had heard many things about him, and he hoped to see some miracle done by him. Then he questioned him with many words, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. Then Herod, with his men of war, treated him with contempt and mocked him, arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him back to Pilate. That very day, Pilate and Herod became friends with each other, for previously they had been at enmity with each other. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you have amazing plans for us this morning related to these verses. Help us to be open to what your Holy Spirit wants to teach us this morning, and and I pray that you'd help us to be willing to be doers of the word, not just hearers only deceiving ourselves. We want to be fashioned by you. We want to further be made into the image of Christ. We want to be made into mature believers, Lord. We know that you, pri- you primarily do that through your word. And so we thank you, Lord, that you exalt your word even above your own name and that every purpose that it's sent to accomplish will be accomplished. So we yield our hearts to you, Lord. We ask that you would do the, the work that only you can, and we yield to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So we're going through and looking at these trials and proceedings. I've called them the sham trials. Um, And we're looking at all six of them. We're going through them. Uh, There are six trials of Jesus in total. Uh, He was before Annas. He was before Caiaphas. Then he was before the whole Sanhedrin. Then last week we saw him go before Pilate. This week we'll see him go before Herod. And then he's going to go back to Pilate for his last trial. So last week we saw him before Pilate for the first time. All the other times, as in all the other times, when he was before Pilate, we see him as we will see him today in control. The whole thing, ever since he was arrested, he's been in control of, of, of the situation and what's happening. You could say it another way. You could say Jesus is the influencer and the others that he's before are the influenced He's, he's in control of the situation. He could have ended it at any moment. He said that. He said that he could call, ask the Father, and he could have 12 legions of, legions of angel, uh, angels rather dispatched. Um, and we know in Scripture that one angel killed 185,000 Assyrians. That could, obviously would have ended things pretty quickly. Uh, and, but he doesn't do that because we're, we're told in Revelation, I think chapter 13, verse 8, that the Lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. And so this was all predetermined. Um, And so whether it was Annas, Caiaphas, the entire Sanhedrin, or Pilate, Jesus was always in control. And and so when Jesus was before Pilate, we saw this last week, um, and Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus responded with a question. You know, you're in, usually you're in control. Salesmen try to do this when you, they, you, they, they answer a question with a question. You know, they're trying to stay in control the whole entire time. But, but he revealed the truth of, you know, reality when he's, when he's asking Pilate back this question, are you speaking for yourself about this or did others tell you this concerning me? And as I said last week, I believe Pilate was signaling to, or excuse me, Jesus was signaling to Pilate that he could have his own conclusion about the identity of Jesus and if Jesus was king of the Jews 
quite apart from this legal proceeding and these official charges being brought before him. I believe he was trying to influence Pilate, trying to reach Pilate. And Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? And I believe by saying I am a Jew, back to Jesus, he's resisting what Jesus is trying to intimate to him. And he was resisting his attempt to get him to have a personal view apart from these charges and to see his identity, even though he wasn't a Jew, see his identity for what it was. And that's when we saw Jesus talked about, talk about the kingdom not being of this world and those who are of the truth hear his voice. And it's still true today. Those of us that are of the truth hear his voice. And, and that sparked Pilate's famous response that we saw last week. And we we see it briefly again in one of our, the one verse that we're in John. What is truth? Pilate was questioning the very concept or foundation or existence of truth like so many today. And, and that's why we looked at the importance of speaking the truth, loving the truth, and living the truth in a lost world that is desperately needing truth. If there's one thing that this lost world needs today is truth. And the enemy is his primary tactic is deception. So he's deceiving all of the time. That's why there's such a battle for information right now. Information is being held from people, and people are in mass coming to the wrong conclusions about things because of an agenda that, that is being energized or um, you know, inspired at least by the enemy because the whole world is under the sway of the devil. The Apostle John would say that in one of his epistles. So he's called us as believers to speak the truth in love. And sometimes we're afraid to speak the truth because we're afraid of hurting someone's feelings or, or telling somebody something they don't want to hear where they would miss, maybe have a visceral response to what we say. But God's called us nevertheless, no matter what the consequences are, to speak the truth in love. Now, in love are guardrails for us in how to communicate the truth. But nevertheless, God wants us to know the truth. Jesus began many of his sentences with amen, amen. To, I tell you the truth. I, most assuredly, I say to you, it's, it's, it's worded many different ways in translations, but he wanted us to know that he has a priority for us to hear the truth. Now, as we move on to the trial before Herod Antipas, we're going to see Jesus not respond to him at all. And you could say that this is the most powerful, noteworthy, non-action in the Bible. The fact that Jesus will not, does not, refuses to respond whatsoever to Herod Agrippa. It's very, very strange, but there's some lessons we can learn from it as we'll see. So the title of my message this morning is, When the Creator Won't Speak to You. So I want to begin with our verses in verse 1. He says there in verse 1, Then the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the, the nation, forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. So we're just at the, looking a little bit from a different vantage point of what we looked at last week when he was before Pilate, because I want us to kind of see the progression of why all of this happened. And, and, and so he questions him, as we saw in verse 3, and, and, then, and then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no fault in this man. He was trying to get out of this whole situation. And it says they are more fierce, stirring up the people, that he stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. And then this is the key. This is why he ended up sending him to Herod. Verse 6, when Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked if the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod who was also in Jerusalem at the time. So again, Pilate's really struggling here. He's in a very difficult situation. He didn't want to crucify him, but he feared the people if he let him go. So basically, Pilate punted. You know, he put off the decision. A lot of times you hear uh, people describe decisions that politicians make where they don't have to face the consequences of their decision, so they don't do anything, and they, what's called that this is the technical phrase, kicking the can down the road. Kicking the can. Just if you want to know the technical word, that's it, the phrase. Kicking the can down the road. He doesn't want to deal with it. 
and, and he'd rather have Herod Antipas deal with him. And, 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 and that was legitimate because you, you really were supposed to be under, the, when, you, when you were tried for things, you were supposed to be in the jurisdiction uh, or at least by the person that oversees where you live. And there were three locations where you could be tried and according to their law. You could be tried in your birthplace. So Jesus could be tried in Bethlehem. Um, you could be tried in your place of residence where you live. So that would probably be Capernaum because Jesus' home base pretty much in his public ministry in the Galilee area was Capernaum. Or you could be tried the place of the crime. And that's basically what Her- uh, Pilate's thinking because he believes that most of these crimes that the Pharisees that were from the Jerusalem area were complaining about, those all happened probably in Jerusalem. I want to give you a little background on Herod Antipas. Uh, he was, <laughs> there's quite a history between he and Jesus, and you need to know a little bit about him. He was, his father was Herod the Great. There was many sons. I think he had 10 sons. Herod the Great did. He killed some of them. He was always paranoid about uh, people succeeding him. Even his family is willing to kill over that. Um, he was an Idumean, and Idumea was uh, an area southeast of Jerusalem. It's the descendants of Esau, that, that established that area. And, and uh, his mother, uh, Herod Antipas's mother, was Sumerian. So he was half Sumerian and half Idumean there. And he considered himself a Sadducee, and the re- religious leaders received him as a Sadducee, though they, they um, because he was used and was in conjun- you know, basically partnered with Rome, they, they had a lot of cynicism related to that being genuine, but they allowed him to go through the motions of, of claiming to be a Sadducee. And so he was considered a king. <clears throat> John Mark in his gospel refers to him as King Herod. And, um, and so again, they had some history. You may remember in the account in Mark there that Herod uh, had committed adultery and illicit and, you know, in his marriage by um, marrying his niece Herodias. And that was the catalyst for Jesus' cousin, John the Baptizer, to confront him about this because he was claiming to be, you know, under the Jewish system, but claiming to be a, um, a, a Sadducee and ultimately got John thrown into prison. This caused, what he said, caused Herodias to burn with indignation. <laughs> That's a way, one way of saying it. Uh, and put her daughter up to dancing before Herod and pleasing him to the point of offering her anything up to half of his kingdom. And according to his traditions, whatever he said in, in this context, he had to fulfill. And, and so he didn't technically have to do that, but he believed that he had to do that. And he was willing to do that, then spare John the baptizer's life, which he should have done. And so um, John, so Herodias also put his, her, his, her daughter up to this whole thing of asking for John the baptizer's head on a platter. So we're told in Mark that he sorrowfully did this. He did it. He was, he was, sor- he was sorrowful, but he, he did it. And he put to, to death um, of John the baptizer, who Jesus said he's the greatest of all the Old Testament prophets. So this man was extremely, extremely wicked and had been so for a very, very long time. And I believe this man, no doubt, seared his conscience. And, and so that's, in part, what's going on here related to Jesus remaining silent when he's before him. Pilate appeared to still have a conscience. We could see, we saw it last week, he's still wrestling with truth, the concept of it. He's still wanting to do the right thing, but he's stuck in his mind in a situation where he can't really, doesn't really have a good answer. He believes that he's accountable to Rome. Of course he is, but he's also accountable to the people. He also knows that this man has a good reputation. Um, And so it appears that he's way better off than Herod. Now, as we've gone through each of these trials, we've seen Jesus engage these different leaders as he's before them. And we've seen something very interesting because I believe... um, the, 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 you know, these, these people that Jesus stood before, Annas, Caiaphas, the Sanhedrin, they were really close to searing their conscience and, and, and getting to that place of no return, so to speak, but they hadn't yet. How do we know? Because when the Jesus was, was before them, 
He spoke scripture to them. He quoted Daniel. He talked about that you'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. And he, even though those are things that they didn't want to hear, he was still quoting scripture, I believe still trying to, to reach them because he said something, <laughs> you know, but here he's not saying anything. You know, we're told in Revelation that with all the wrath that God's going to pour out on this world, we're told that they still would not repent, which presupposes that God is trying to reach this world as he's pouring out his wrath on this world. They still would not repent. He's still giving them a chance to repent. As long as God's word and God is still speak, God going out and God is still speaking, there's still an opportunity for people to respond to God's word and to repent. And if you don't know the Lord if, and all of that, the proper response is to repent and, and turn to God. So, so Jesus is still trying. That's why I believe he's trying, still trying to reach those people. And we saw that with Annas and Caiaphas and before the whole Sanhedrin. And you know, even before Pilate, he spoke truth. He wasn't quoting scripture, but he spoke truth. And so that, I believe, means that they could still receive the truth. There was still a possibility. They hadn't gone past the point of no return. And so they were, I believe, still reachable. It wasn't too late. But I believe with Herod, it was too late. I believe he had gone past that point. And then we also need to understand that um, there was a point at which Jesus wanted the Pharisees to communicate something to Herod. And this is, again, connected to Jesus' history with Herod. In Luke chapter 13, verses 31 through 33, we're told on that very day, some Pharisees came saying to him, get out and depart from here for Herod wants to kill you. And I believe they were saying that so they'd come to their jurisdiction so they could arrest him and kill him. Um, it's not like they're trying to help him out. They're trying to, to drive him to their jurisdiction. And we're told, and he said to them, go tell that fox, behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. Nevertheless, I must journey today, tomorrow, and the, fo- and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem, slamming Jerusalem in, in, in the sense of the prophet, or the people killing the prophets and all of that. So he says, go tell that fox. That wasn't a compliment. Back in my day, we would refer to a good-looking girl as a fox. It wasn't anything that was negative, trust me. She's a fox, man. If you said that now, I wonder what the, what the, the youth of America or the world would say to that, uh, a fox. But one of the things that we, we see in the original language, there is original language for this, obviously. He uses the feminine, Luke does, the feminine version of the word fox. So it was a, it was a, a vixen, ooh, a vixen, a female fox. Um, I don't know. Maybe females were worse. I, I don't know. I'm not saying that. I mean, you can't put that, read that into it. I'm not doing that. You know, Tony may be doing that, but I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that for sure. Um, but foxes were considered very cunning, very sneaky, and, and, and very uh, efficient predators. So he's saying to the Pharisees, he's, first of all, he's trusting the Pharisees to relay a message. And this is what he's saying to a king. Mark calls him a king. You go tell that fox thus. You know, I wonder if Herod even got past the word fox when he, if he ever heard that message. You know, his mind probably went a million different directions. He just called me, what? And then he you know, didn't hear all the rest of the things that Jesus added after that. So Herod beheaded John, as, as I talked about, and then um, he was tormented by what he did. And we see that in Mark as well. When he heard of Jesus' miracles and ministry, he kind of went crazy and thought it was John uh, having been raised from the dead. And I want to read a couple of scriptures that substantiate that. Now, Her- King Herod heard of him, for his name had become well known. And he said, John the Baptist is risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him, talking about Jesus. And then another two verses later, he said, but then Herod heard he said, this is John whom I beheaded. Or, but when Herod heard, he said, this is John whom I beheaded. He has been raised from the dead. So there was just a compounded wickedness in Herod's heart 
um, that had taken a toll on Herod. You know, that we're told in Scripture that the way of the transgressor is hard. It's a hard life. Being in rebellion to God is anything but a hard life, even though there may be this great mirage, especially with people in the world that are wealthy or famous or whatever, and everything looks great on the outside, but all of them have, you know, not all of them, but I mean, they, 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 they admit that talking about how often they need uh, shrinks or they need, not there's anything wrong with going to a psychologist, but you know, they need help. A lot of them are on drugs. A lot of them commit suicide. They, they, they reach the pinnacle of everything that they dreamed and it didn't bring that fulfillment. It didn't bring that ultimate um, joy. When someone really knows Christ, there's no looking for other things. If, if people are, are still looking for, you know, uh, searching for what they are been looking for, after they claim to know Christ, they didn't really come to know Christ. There's never a, when there's a transformation, that's the only thing that God knows how to do in a life is transformation. When he transforms a life, there's no, nothing else that we go, well, I, that's, this is great, but what about this? What if I had this? What if I, I'm not saying you're, you're never tempted. I'm not saying that, but in terms of like the ultimate meaning of life, the ultimate purpose of why I'm here and all of those things don't just pass away just because something happens or whatever. It's, it's like you're transformed. When you meet the risen Christ for real, you're never, ever, 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 ever the same. You, cannot, you can not live for him, but you can't deny that it's the truth and you're, and you're living against what he wants because he's very good at disciplining us. He's very good at disciplining us, and he will do that. And one of, it's, as it's been said, one of the harder things than his will is being out of his will. And he has a way of disciplining us. I mean, read Hebrews chapter 12. Read how he disciplines us so perfectly as a loving father would. And, and so God, it's, a, it's not like punitive, punishing us, trying to hurt us. It's trying to help redirect us back to him because he has only good for us. He only wants good. He uses challenges. He uses tragedy. He uses all these things that happen and to make us more Christ-like, more submitted to him, more uh, full of joy, more able to be able to share with somebody going through a trial, hey, I've been there. I know what that's like. Let me tell you about God's faithfulness. And we have to keep our focus on the right thing and the truth. Now, in verse 8, we see Herod's reaction to Jesus is being brought before him. Look at verse 8. Now, when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he had desired for a long time to see him because he had heard many things about him, and he hoped to see some miracle done by him. To Herod Antipas, Jesus was merely an amusement piece or entertainment. He was just a novelty. You know, it was common for kings back then to have court jesters and people perform for them. I remember in high school, there was a, there was a party that we were, a costume party we were supposed to go to, and me and my two other friends, my other partners in crime, we dressed up like court jesters in a full costume with the, hat, the, head, the head thing with the little bells, the little pointy toes. We had it all. We were definitely fools uh, for sure. Um, and, and, and we thought we were so creative, but we were just looked like how we were dressed. We, were, we looked like uh, fools. So they would come and perform for them and entertain them. It was very common. And so it, he was treating Jesus like kind of like some sideshow like some novelty, like some, oh, this is interesting. I've never seen this before. I've heard of these things. I've never seen these things. And I want to see it for myself. I want to experience that. That's kind of how the world can be with Jesus. They want to be entertained. They want to see the things that titillate them. But they're not interested, just like Herod wasn't, in his teaching, in his identity, in what he says to us that is eternal in nature. Jesus doesn't want fans. He wants followers. He wants disciples. He said, if anyone come, wants to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. There's no conditions connected to that. There's no, okay, Lord, I'll do that, based, but if you have to act this way, you have to do this for me. He doesn't do that. We're called to be bond servants, which means willing slaves to God, to, for Jesus. And it's a privilege that and, and we have no expectation. When the disciples said yes to that calling to go follow Jesus, there was no, 
writers and contracts that they had to work out and negotiate. They had no idea where they would go, how long they would be there, what they'd be doing. I think of uh, a Philip in the Ethiopian eunuch. He was in Samaria having, experiencing this great revival. God was using him greatly, and then out of nowhere, God just tells him, go to the desert. Doesn't tell him what he would do, doesn't tell him how long he was going to be there, and he went. Left success, left prosperity, left all the things that the world treasures. Ministry success, things that the, the, the church you know, celebrates and loves. He left all of that. No one, including Philip, would understand, but God would understand. And God had a plan that he didn't know anything about because when he was in that desert, he was going to see this Ethiopian eunuch coming and he was going to be sharing the gospel from Isaiah 53 and explaining to him all those things. So the, Herod was not interested in his teaching, his identity, his wisdom, nothing. He just wanted to be entertained. And so um, what, what he didn't understand, just like many today, is what is the true value of of the Lord Jesus. Or you could say it this way, what is he good for? The world thinks this. They think, what is Jesus good for? They don't know what his purpose is. They're confused, honestly confused about why, why Jesus is, was there, you know, came. They may not even think that he came from heaven to earth, but why he existed, what his purpose was, it's up to us to explain that. To, to them, why Jesus came, what he means for them. Because the, Jesus, the, what he did for us screams at man's need. But a lot of people don't know what their need is because they don't understand why Jesus came. What, you, you cannot disconnect my need for Jesus with why Jesus came because Jesus came for me. He, and, and he came to meet a true need that I have. And, and so you could word it this way, what is Jesus for? Or, or what about Jesus should we desire? Or, you know, if you're an unbeliever, what is Jesus' value for me? Because people think, oh, he's just a good teacher. He's just a good example. He's just a prophet. A lot of people will say he was a prophet. But he was so much more than a prophet. He was a prophet. Moses promised one that would be like him that would come. He was the prophet that came. But he was God. He was divine. And, and, and good prophets don't claim to be God when they're mistaken. So he, was, he brings us to this conclusion that's inescapable. And he says, I have salvation with me. I want to forgive you. I want to die for you. I want to ra be raised from the dead. I want to give you eternal life as a gift. It's a gift that we can't earn. So we have to be able to deal with that and and, and, and be able to answer, what is Jesus good for? What is this? Is he just as a, a great moral teacher? And I'm just, he just wants to take good people, make them better. He wants to take, you know, you know, morally neutral people or good people and just make them better people and, and more successful. So much of the world thinks that his only purpose is to show us a way to live with our existing lives to make us more successful. And he modeled the way to live a successful life. What he modeled was dying to the Father's will every day, being submitted to that. That's what he modeled. That's what he calls us to do. He, it's, if, you, if you're thinking that it's about just, I only get good things from God. That's the only thing that I ever get from God is good things. You don't understand that how God uses what we would call bad things for his purposes in our lives and how he uses those things to do miracles and to make us more like Christ and all these things to produce godly character and everything. So at the center, again, of, of why Jesus came is our need. And as Christians, even after we come to know the Lord, we need Jesus every day. We don't stop needing Jesus because we receive salvation as a gift. We, we need Jesus every single day. We, he wants us to depend on him every day. He said to the disciples, we saw it when we looked at the upper room discourse, when he said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. You know, he said, apart from me, you can do nothing. He's speaking to people that claim to be the greatest. These apostles were fighting over who's the greatest. What a great room that was to, to listen in. How would you like it if the leaders here were fighting when you came in about who's the greatest? You just do a U-turn and walk right back out, <laughs> you know, and I wouldn't blame you. But that, that is so carnal. That is so ungodly. So we can assume that people know why he came, but they, most of people don't know why he came. 
I ask the question sometimes, why did Jesus come to the earth? Opens up a lot of questions, a lot of comments, a lot of discussions to be able to explain that. They don't know, and they, and they need to know. Now look at Jesus' response to Herod in verse 9. Then he questioned him with many words. That he, Herod questioned Jesus with many words, but he answered him nothing. Again, the most famous or impactful or significant non-action in the entire Bible. I mean, maybe you can suggest some other ones. I can't, I can't think of one that would be more significant than this. It was Jesus and the fox face to face. He was right there in front of that cunning, that you know, crafty female vixen fox right there. He's right before him. Herod had wanted to see him all this time. He'd heard about him. He's right before him. And Jesus answered nothing. You know what it, you know what it means in the original language? Nothing? It means nothing. You know, deep stuff, I know. Um, he had talked to Pilate. He didn't talk to Herod. He talked to Annas, who wouldn't talk to Herod. He talked to Caiaphas, wouldn't talk to Herod. He talked to the whole Sanhedrin. Again, quoting scripture, meaning he's trying to reach them, meaning it's not too late for them. Didn't talk to Herod. Said nothing to Herod. Pilate still had a conscience. I believe all of the whole Sanhedrin still had a conscience. We're told the Pharisees, after bringing the woman caught in the very act of adultery to Jesus, after Jesus wrote in the sand, likely their sins or who knows what, I don't know. John wrote in, in John chapter 8, then those who heard it, being convicted, what's the next three words? By their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. So even the Pharisees and Sadducees had consciences, not Herod. There was not one reason for Jesus to say one syllable to Herod. Again, he quoted scripture before Annas, Caiaphas, the entire Sanhedrin. He revealed truth to Pilate. He's not done dealing with Pilate. He's not done talking to Pilate. He's still going to talk to Pilate. But he said nothing to Herod, which means there was a chance of those other men responding to truth. But when Jesus says absolutely nothing, not one thing, I, you know, you just think about what is going on in Jesus that he would hold his peace and not say one thing, nothing at all, not one word, not one syllable. You know, scripturally, there can come a point where the Lord stops speaking, which reminds us as believers how much of a privilege it is to hear God speak to us. You know, there's general revelation, which is the creation of, and that speaks to us that God exists. And then there's special revelation, which is the Bible. And then there's specific revelation, which is God speaking to each believer. I'm thankful for all three. When I see creation and heaven declares the glory of God and I see everything that's been made and I, so man is without excuse, as Romans 1 talks about, I'm thankful that God has made this so crystal clear. You have to harden your heart in unrighteousness, as Romans 1 teaches, to suppress the truth, to, to hide from the fact that God has revealed himself, that he exists. The laws of logic reveal that God exists. We didn't make those up, though we discovered those. We discovered math. We, didn't, we, we titled math. We organized it with titles. We didn't invent the concepts of math. That's general revelation, brother and sister. That is revealing that God exists. That shouldn't exist from just, we're just chemicals bumping into each other. The fact that there's laws, there's natural law. We didn't think up the scriptures. I know that the Jews didn't th make up everything in the Old Testament because they wouldn't have made themselves look that bad. I know I wouldn't, you wouldn't. If we were making something up, we wouldn't. And if you don't agree with that, you don't know the Old Testament. Because when you see this cyclical thing of them falling, serving false gods, calling out to God in repentance after God judges them, God takes them back. And we see this cycle over and over, them doing, right in their, doing what's right in their own eyes. We realize no one would admit that and write that down for all of posterity to not just read, but study <laughs> if, if those things weren't the case. And, and, and Jesus promised the Old Testament, I mean, validated the Old Testament. He promised the New Testament. He said to the disciples, I'll, I'll bring all things back to your remembrance, the things that I have spoken to you. 
So there's a time at which God stops speaking. Now, we know scriptures like, don't answer a fool according to his folly, but we know that this is kind of going a little bit beyond that. See, what, what's going on here, I believe, is, is Jesus is a good steward of revelation, and we can't forget that revelation is a privilege. You know, the word revelation means to unveil. You know, you've ever seen um, when they have busts, you know, artistic busts, uh, and they cover them with like this velvet, you know, um, drape or whatever, and in a moment in time, they just go, whoosh, and they pull it away, and you, can, you don't see anything until you see everything, and you see this, this, this bust there. That's the word they would use to describe revelation, unveiling. You would unveil something, and you don't see anything until you see all of it, and the source of it isn't you. It's something else that gave you that information, and, and, and it's, it's, it's a beautiful study when you, when you, when you get into it. But um, this goes deeper. This is, this is a, we have to be good stewards of this revelation that we've received. We have to value this revelation. You know, there are people in China that fight over one page of Scripture. They hold on to it, they read it, they memorize it, and then they trade it to somebody else because they can't have a whole Bible. I found a great ministry that we're going to support as a church where they sneak Bibles into Iran. And you can, you, can put, you can basically pay for a whole New Testament to go into Iran secretly for five bucks. Oh yeah, you know we're going to be supplying some New Testaments to Iran. Those people are so hungry. There's stories of them sneaking out of the country just begging to hear about Jesus. And thousands and thousands and thousands of people are getting saved. Of course the news isn't going to report that. They don't want to report that, but that's happening all the time. There's all different ways that we can be used by God in that way, and it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. But revelation is a privilege, and he trained his disciples. We see it in the Gospels where he's telling them to be very judicious about who they share with and how long they share God's truth when he sends them out in different times in his public ministry. At one point, Jesus told them, do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under your feet and turn and tear you in pieces. So there's a, he wants us to be good stewards of this, this revelation. He wants to value, us to value it as, as revelation from him. And it's a privilege to hear it, and it's a privilege to keep hearing it. That's what he's getting at in that verse. Because we can't prejudge ahead of time who gets to hear the gospel, who gets to hear God's word, or who will, who will believe. You ever done that where you're like, oh, they're probably going to not receive. I've done this so many times. They're probably not going to be friendly to the gospel or not want to hear it. And I'm, I'm like battling. The Lord keeps saying, share, share, share. And I'm resisting, thinking that they're just going to reject it. What I'm concerned about is them rejecting me. It's not about anything more spiritual than that. I just don't want to feel the, the rejection. And he says, just share. And I share, and they have the opposite view. We can make excuses for people and think that they're not going to receive, and we can prejudge. Who's done that here? Who wants to be honest and says, who's, who's done that? Oh, so there's some people that still don't want to raise their hand. It's okay. We, we, just, we believe that you're silently in your heart raising your hand. How's that? Uh, but it's true. We do that all the time. He's talking about sharing first with somebody. And then they have a visceral or negative response to that. That's when he says to shake the dust off your feet. So we're called to be faithful to share the message, but we have to work with the Holy Spirit. We have to see who's open to a sharing. And when they're open, we share more. If they're closed, we stop sharing. I'm not talking about people that, that are around us all the time, family members and everything. Of course, we want to be sensitive to that too and everything. I'm talking about people that we meet for the first time. And, and we're trying to gauge whether or not they're welcoming revelation. And if they're not welcoming revelation, then Jesus says to, it's a bad, it's bad stewardship to keep trying to force something when they're not open. And so it's, a, it's an important lesson obviously Herod was not open whatsoever. He hadn't been open for many, many years, and he had done all this wickedness. And he was a Sadducee. He knew at least the law, because they only believed in the law, the Sadducees. He knew at least that. And so he, there was accountability there, and he rejected it and pushed that down, suppressed it, buried it, and he had, it had horrible consequences in his life. 
We need to be looking where the Holy Spirit is working and cooperate with Him. That's the thing. The key about sharing your faith is understanding you're partnering with someone. You're partnering with the Holy Spirit. You're both, the Holy Spirit is more behind you sharing the gospel than you are. He, he is more for it. He's more excited about it. He's more into it and, and wanting it to happen than you could ever want. And he, he works on both ends. And when you trust the Holy Spirit's ministry to convict, as Jesus said, he does, the world of righteous and judgment and all these things, the things that he, and convict means to make an airtight case. So in their heart, he does something way beyond what we could possibly do. He makes an airtight case in their heart that they're guilty and they need a Savior. As I said a week or two ago, we can bring people, or people to Jesus, but only the Holy Spirit can bring Jesus to people. You know what I'm saying. We can bring the gospel to people. Only God can bring them to Jesus. You know? and, and, and you may not see that, that there's a big difference in that, but we just communicate the message. We're not going to be held accountable for people's response to the gospel. We're only going to be held accountable to delivering the message. But we have to deliver the message. We have to be faithful to do that. My prayer, and we pray uh, in pre-service prayer for, for our church to grow in their confidence in the power of the gospel and grow in their confidence in the power of prayer. And as we do that, the two things, the two main things that Christians struggle with is prayer and preaching the gospel. And those are the two things that move the needle more than anything else. And that's why the enemy works so hard to keep people out of prayer meetings, to keep people away from sharing their faith, because that's the means by which people get saved, and he knows that. So the, um, Jesus now, he, is, he's, he, he, he gets to this point where he just says nothing, and he knows that Herod's crossed the line. And, and so now he says in verse 10, the, res the response there to his silence we see it says, and the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. Now, we can't miss the suffering that he's hap this is happening. Remember, this is hard for Jesus as a human to, to be falsely accused. You ever been falsely accused? Jesus can, re can, can, can relate to that. And, and then Herod, with his men of war, his soldiers, treated him with contempt and mocked him arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him back to Pilate. So have you ever been treated with contempt? Have you ever been mocked? Jesus knows how that feels. He identifies with it. And this is part of the suffering that was necessary. Again, I've said this from the very beginning. There's nothing that Jesus went through that wasn't absolutely necessary to pay the price for our redemption. It was all necessary. And he wants us to be thankful. And I am thankful today. And he wants us to continuously... Um, think about that and think back on that. And then it says in verse 12, that very day, Pilate and Herod became friends with each other, for previously they had been at enmity with each other. They had been at odds. We don't know what that was about. There was a uh, something that happened where there was these shields that, that talked about worshiping Caesar, that Caesar is God. And Pilate had put those shields in Herod's palace. And there was a lot of them. And it caused an uproar in Jerusalem. And it caused such an uproar that, that the Herods, you know, like four of the Herods anyway, went to Rome to talk to, the, to Caesar and asked if, they would, if he would force Pilate to remove those shields and put them in one of the, the, the uh, pagan temples. And he ended up doing that. So we don't know if it was over that or something else, but they just didn't get along. People in power, a lot of times they rub each other the wrong way. They get threatened by each other. Who knows what? But they, now they were like super best buds, BFFs here, um, and, and got, you know, got along from this point, which doesn't say anything positive about Pilate because Pilate still had a conscience. He still was wrestling with truth. And here he is aligning himself and becoming a friend with someone who had a seared conscience, had someone that, that, was, that was not worthy of Jesus to say a word to him. And that's a warning. That's a warning for anybody. Be careful who you're around. Be careful who you um, are friends with. Be careful who you give priority to in your life. You know, we're told that evil company corrupts good morals. 
We can say that we're so spiritual, we're super hyper-spiritual, you know, that we're immune to being affected by those around us, but we're not. We're affected by it, whether we realize it or not. And I've seen too many times crash and burn with people's growth because they compromise that principle. And I'm not saying we can never be around unbelievers. Of course, we have to be around unbelievers. We have to live in this world. Paul talks about that, that we'd have to leave the world. But to not, to not have them as our main relationships is something that can drag us down. We need to, you know, if it's really wise to be around people that are more mature than us, and they can lift us up, you know, but especially not being around people that can take us down. And the Holy Spirit's so faithful to say, hey, that person's bad news for you. That person's bad news. And we can still love them, we can still be there for them, but they're not the main people that we're around. So the great thing we can think about as I close here is we need to be so thankful for God speaking to us, that he still speaks to us, that he still convicts us of sin. If you're here and you don't know the Lord and you are wrestling with your conscience, you know you're guilty, you know you need Jesus, we'd love to have you come forward. We'd love to have you pray to be able to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you're watching online you know, you can contact us in the comments. And, but, you know, here, we need to be thankful for that. It's, it's when we're not feeling anything at all, and we don't hear God speak at all, um, that's when we have to be concerned. You know, some people worry about the, what is the sin, I've been asked many times, what is the sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit, the one sin that can't be forgiven? It's giving the enemy credit for something that God de- does, and in the, in the context of rejecting Jesus. And so, if you're worried, if you've, I always say this, and it's so true and makes sense to people once they hear it, but if you're worried about having committed that sin, then you haven't committed that sin, because if you had committed that sin, you wouldn't be worried about it. You wouldn't be concerned about it. The fact that you're concerned shows that there's conviction, shows that there's, um, there's still, you're st- you haven't reached that point. And we, none of us know when someone reaches that point. That's between them and God. We still need to be faithful, never stop praying for people, never stop telling them, the things that God tells us to tell them and everything. But this is a warning for us and to understand as we share our faith, there is a point where God stops speaking. There is a point where God allows us to... to, He basically, like he did with Pharaoh, he confirms or solidifies what we've already decided. He, he, He puts a mold around it in the sense of hardening that, confirming that decision that we've made. I love that God speaks to us. I love that he speaks to me and, and, and he loves to do it. The apostle, I want to close by reading, I said I'm closing, but I'm doing my second close. Okay. So, th- but this is the final close. Um, the apostle Paul said in Romans 1, 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do things which are not fitting. It's a sobering verse. There's a point at which unbelievers can get to the point where they're beyond the reach. They seared their conscience, and they're, 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 God just gives them over, go over, gives them over to their debased mind. That's what happened with, that's what happened with uh, Herod. Jesus didn't say a word to him. Jesus, again, in control. Jesus is the one influencing, not being the one influenced. Now he's going to be shipped back to Pilate for his final trial. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, we thank you that you speak to us. We're so thankful that you convict us. Thank you that you guide us and you, you show us things that are hard to see sometimes. But we're so thankful that you, um, you, you do it and you love to do it. You said in Genesis that you will not always strive with man. We're so thankful, Lord, that you are long-suffering and you, you, we love your voice. We love your revelation. Help us to be good stewards of it when we communicate it to people Lord, and in our own lives as we appropriate your truths, help us to be obedient to what you say and be yielded to you speaking to us and redirecting us. Thank you for the privilege of revelation, Lord. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.